Welcome to the Australia Remembers podcast. My name is Michael Madden. First of all, I'll start by apologising for not having released a podcast for some time. Uh, Gordon Trail and myself have been very busy in different directions. Gordo's currently finishing off a book on the Invictus Games, which I believe will be coming out sometime in April around um, Anzac Day. That should be a wonderful book from what I've seen. Uh, he's doing a good job. Myself, uh, just been picking up the pieces since my last book and trying to get a few things in order. So we've both been under the pump in different ways. It occurred to me some time ago that after writing the Victoria Cross Australia Remembers, I have quite a few interviews with family members recorded. One is one that you're going to hear today with Keith Payne and his wife Flo, two wonderful Australians who I consider friends. Uh, I interviewed them in a hotel room a number of years ago now for the book. Keith talks a lot about his history, uh, being awarded the Victoria Cross, his action. He talks a lot about Ray Simpson and the other Victoria Cross recipients from Vietnam Dasha Wheatley and Badco, as well as Ray. Uh, Interestingly, uh, Keith was involved in Ray Simpson's VC action in a roundabout way, which you'll hear. And also Flo talks about life as a wife of a a veteran and uh, somebody who is at war and what her experiences were like and some rather awful times that she had when Keith was at war. I found uh, that story particularly moving uh, with my own uh, mother being through the same thing. It was uh, wonderful to hear her point of view and it it casts some light on the fact that the Victoria Cross in particular, as well as service from any person, involves much more than just the person, the the soldier, the sailor, the airman. It's an entire family who is involved. It's a community that is affected when somebody is killed or a Victoria Cross is awarded. Hopefully this podcast and this discussion will shed a bit of light on that. It is, uh, again, when I recorded this, I hadn't wasn't my intention to release it as an audio file. So I have done my best to clean it up. My voice, I wasn't mic'd. Um, Keith and Flo were. So I've tried to cut myself out a little bit and uh, just to make it a bit more pleasant on the ear. There'll be a few more to follow in the future, some very, very interesting ones, which I won't talk about until I've spoken to the families. Uh, but I'll get back to you on that shortly. Uh, Gordo and I are hoping to get back to producing these more regularly within the next month or two. We have a few things to get sorted. Uh, In the meantime, I hope you enjoy this. I give you Keith and Flo Payne. We are at war with Japan. Failure will make him inch by inch and that he shall not enter upon our country. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Before I joined the Army, one of those things my old man said to me, he said, well, you be mates with the quartermaster and the cook. (laughs) And uh, that was good advice. My military service, well, uh, in the latter end of uh, World War II, before the sea flights, uh, they started the uh, CMF, and uh, along with the CMF was the regimental cadets. Uh, I was old enough to go into the regimental cadets, so I, I joined the cadets, and uh, I served with them uh, as a cadet uh, until I was 17, and at the time the uh, government brought out that the enlistment age would be 17. So I enlisted in the CMF whilst awaiting uh, a shuffling thing with uh, my uh, employer uh, to, so that I could uh, enlist in the regular army. Uh, he didn't want, I was an apprentice, he didn't want to cancel my indentures and uh, we had a slight altercation and uh, 
he, he said, well, I'll sack you. And I said, well, why didn't you do that in the first damn place? We've decided all this problem, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, away I went to uh, into the regular army, uh, done my recruit training at the Nogra, uh, follow-up training down at Pukapunyal. Uh They just started national service. Uh, I was... Uh, we were in training over at uh, Site 17, which was across the way from the old infantry centre. And then I, uh, then we moved into Pucka camp itself, and then uh, gradually they threw us out of the buildings to let, uh, so that the National Service could have them, and they put us in tents out at Scrub Hill. And, uh, and that's where we completed our training uh, prior to uh, uh, moving off to Japan and then Korea. I was posted initially when I came out of Korea to uh, a cadet battalion, which was good. Uh, I was working with the instructors, and every now and again they'd say, right, you give this lesson because I'd heard it given that many damn times, and it, you know, it was a parrot passion. But it was a good introduction to uh, my main thing that I did in the, in the military was I was an instructor. That's, that's where I ended up. Uh, and then, of course, being an instructor, I sort of specialised in uh, weapons and minor tactics rather than the parade ground. The parade ground was not my forte at all. I, you know, I, I knew all about that parade ground uh, and I found that uh, I, I was a lot more comfortable uh, doing weapons and minor tactics. Minor tactics became my major thing, right? Uh, teaching minor tactics. So, uh, 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 from there, I went to 11 National Service. Uh, I met my bride, of course, in, in this period that I was in Townsville. I met my bride in 1954, 54 years. I met my bride. Uh, it was a, a, a strange sort of a, a, a meeting. I was on a motor transport course. I had to go and get, do a mil, get a military driver's license. I could drive, and, I, and nobody was going to, you know, those days, uh, the military, you had to get these, all these courses and everything, which was good too. It was uh, uh, interesting enough. And of course, Flo was uh, at that time on a clerical course uh, at the trade training centre. So, uh, boy meets girl. Six weeks later, we're engaged. Flo remained in Brisbane, uh, and she was uh, out at uh, the National Service uh, doing her typing bits and whatever. And I shoveled back to Townsville to uh, my battalion. We corresponded by telephone, and uh, you know. and so uh, that was in when. March, did he uh, February, March? Uh, April, May. April, May. And then... Uh, May, June. May, June, I think. Then uh, uh, Flay came up to meet my parents. Uh, my mum... <laughs> my, my mum said... Because I didn't tell her. She, she read it in the paper. Or somebody read it in the paper and they told mum that I was engaged and, and all the rest. Bloody marrying a floozy from Brisbane. And I said, oh, right, right. Uh, anyhow, uh, the floozy arrived in, in Townsville and the family were there. And, and, and of course, Flo stepped off the plane and they're looking for this floozy from Brisbane and Flo was in uniform and that's sort of put them back a pace or two. Right? And... Uh, and then, of course, I was uh, I was in camp at Salim at the time, weren't I? Right. And you came up, and uh, and and then 
in, in the December. That, this, is, this is a startling romance, isn't it? Six weeks here, engaged. The 4th of December, we're, we're married. So isn't that amazing? And, and my mother said that it'll never last. I plotted on because uh, I went into an 11 National Service. I was instructing now, and that, I was in my my business. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, I died, 11 National Service closed down. I went back to the battalion, 3 RAR, because uh, I was 1 RAR in Korea. And I went back to the regiment with three RAR and then poddled off to Malaya and uh, came home from Malaya. The National Service started again, but a different little thing. And uh, I was, uh, when instructing, I was a warrant officer now. I'm, I'm going up in that rank, you know. Yeah. All along the track, you go up a little bit. And uh, so I went to Skyville, and I had uh, three sergeants in my little group, and we were doing weapon training and minor tactics field uh, uh, field work, you know. So, and and that was a great experience. Uh, I trained uh, uh, the likes of. Tim Fisher and Ronnie, who was a couple of the other prominent piece, people uh, come up along the road. But uh, Jeff Kenneth. Jeff Kenneth. Mm. And uh, uh, Somebody else. That, that was a great turning point in my life. Like the National Service. Yeah, instructing there because not only did I remain in my own wing of the uh, establishment, I was also working with the tactics wing, right? Uh, so wherever we went, I was doing tactics with uh, the whole, uh, the, all the cadets putting them through the, the paces and what have you. It was a learning curve for myself for what was to happen. Right? Uh, it, it gave me, it took me away from the platoon aspect to now the battalion aspect uh, of uh, tactics. And these were, this was pretty serious stuff we were teaching the cadets. Uh, so it, it was good for me. And of course, then uh, I had to escape from Skyville, uh, and escape it did. Right? Uh, Norm Goldsmink uh, was to go to, uh, he was to go to Papua New Guinea, and uh, they said, no, Norm, you're not going to New Guinea. You're going to Vietnam for six months, and coming back, and you're going as RSM, uh, uh, RMC. So uh, Norm, Norm thought, oh, well, that's all right. And he said to me, hey, Payne, you want to go to New Guinea? I said, oh, I'll go anywhere, mate. I've got to get out of here. <laughs> uh, so I was posted then to TPIR, which was another good learning curve. Right? I was now, uh, I, was, I was the regimental duty whale. Uh, and my first little job, um, the CA said, I want you to start an NCO course. And I said, oh, right, oh, well, that's okay. I said, where's all the stores and everything? Oh, go down and see the RQMS, put in your stores list for all your tents, etc. And I said, this is a bloody good job. This one I walked into. So, uh, I was given a, a block in a unit about that big, and that was supposed to be my office, right? And, and I started filling out not only uh, stores lists and everything, but I had to do a whole program, build up the program for the NTA training. 
And then uh, the next thing, uh, the two I see come down here, because I knew Wally Campbell at the time. Wally and I'd served together back then. And uh, he said, you're, you're going to be the two I see of the company. And I said, what company? He said, Alpha Company. You're going up to uh, Wanamo and uh, you're going to do... You, you're going to patrol the bloody Star Mountains. And I said, that's bloody lovely. So, learning curve again. Right. I now had the uh, OC was uh, a nice bloke, but he wasn't up to all this stuff. Right. So, all this stuff fell back on me, right? And uh, working with the PIs, Indigenous people, uh, was a great thing, right? The learning curve. So after I'd finished doing the patrolling and everything get, uh, out, of, out of Wanamo, I came back and they said, right, oh, now you're the toco. I'm, I'm, I'm now... I'm now the bloody wheels man of the battalion, right? Which bought me a, a, another little nice learning curve because I now had to arrange to move companies in vehicles from point A to point B and get back again in the weather and the rain and everything uh, and to move those vehicles with PI drivers uh, was... A challenge, I'd a say that. A real challenge. But uh, once again, a, a good learning curve, right? Uh, arranging transport. The, so from New Guinea, I came, uh, I finally, finally they said, You're going to Vietnam. And I said, Whoa, it's on, right? So they brought me back, and I'd done uh, the. Uh, a, course with the IATTV, uh, uh, doing it at Kanunga and uh, the uh, language course down at the uh, Intelligence Centre. Uh, and that was all interesting stuff. And then I, I had some leave over the Christmas uh, prior to you left. being deployed to Vietnam. Uh, in the January of January of February February of uh, of sixty nine. So uh, uh, and uh, now the shocks came. <laughs> the, the shocks came. I uh, I was willed into the CO uh, R D F Lloyd, who I'd already met anyhow. And he said, OK, you're going to, uh, you're being posted to, to uh, the Fish Special Forces Group. And I said, oh, well, okay. that's interesting, Special Forces. So I went up, we went over to the island for a start, uh, Entree Island, and we were supposed to be there for two weeks and we were only there for four days. And... Uh, uh, the group of us that were going to Special Forces, all, all four of us, we were doing training there to marry in with the Americans, and I think we were training the Americans how to marry, but he will do some things. I don't think I really sort of thought, oh, this is going to make it his life work or anything like that. It was just an acceptance. He was in the Army, and that was it. You know, and being in the army myself, I was able to understand things probably better than what uh, a lot of the other wives could do. So, and I can remember he'd been in, been into Victoria Barracks, and I was waiting for him to come home, and I was ironing, and I'm thinking to myself, I don't know which is going to be the worst carrying on without him and being in Vietnam or having him at home moaning and groaning 
because he couldn't get to Vietnam. I really don't know. But that was short-lived because when he got home, he was going. What had occurred? Right, both Jimmy Gietrich and myself, and Jim, Jim and I had served together. Jim, I was Dean Sergeant in, uh, in, in Charlie Company in 3RIR, and Jim was the uh, CSM. Jim, so, uh, Jim, Jim got smacked up, up at the lot. Up at uh, on the DMZ, and his arm was bloody bulging. and he was, because Flo and I went and visited him in hospital, hospital. Right? and he squeezed in a little ball, and I, and I said, how's it going, Jim? And he said, oh, gung ho, mate, I'm going back. And I said, Flo, when we left the hospital, I said to Flo, he won't be going back, mate. No, he won't be going back. And here he is at the same time, ready to go back, and I'm ready to go back, and they put us in a bloody acoustic bloody test. And, oh. <laughs> and we're both, we're both hard of hearing. Right? And they, they said, well, you just can't go. Uh, you know, you, you're CZD, home's on, home only. Oh, wow. <laughs> so Ron Cowery, Major Cowery, was the commander at... Uh, uh, out at uh, the personnel depot, and I said, give us a loan to your phone. And I picked up the phone, and I, the director of infantry was Dave Allen, who was the company commander <laughs> when Jim was the CSM and I was the platoon sergeant. So you can see what's happening here. And I said, they tell us we can't go. And he said, Who, who's with you? And I said, Gidrich, and he said, put him on, <laughs> give it a button. So Jim's out of yarn and we're laughing a bit. And, and Ron Carey was, he, he was pretty serious where we thought he was going. Yeah. You know? And, uh, <laughs> Jim gave Ron Carey the bloody phone and, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> and that was it. On that plane we went. <laughs> I was out of the army then because I got met at that time. Uh, once you got married, that was it. You were discharged, really? not like today. And uh, um, so, yeah, he was in the army. And that's that's it. Yeah, that's his job. That's what he's doing. And uh, you pressed the clothes and starched clothes and. Yeah, felt like um, top of the wazza when they come home and said I was drawn out of, out to uh, as an example for pressing of you know the dress of the uniform and everything you know. But I made one very big mistake when I first got we first were married in Townsville, and the cut of the the greens as it was in those days, and some of the cut cuts Kaki, of the. Mom. The cutting of the the trousers was not very good, and to to get the creases right, that was terrible. I'm performing because by this time I'd fallen pregnant too, and I had a big tummy and what have you, and I was sort of did emotional, you know. Anyhow, Keith come along and he says, "Show me, dear." He says, "I'll fix it for you." I said, no, I'll get it right. If it, even if it kills me, I'm going to get it right. And that was the, my biggest mistake because I should have just said, right, and you can continue to do them. A, lo a lot of our correspondence, uh, uh, and I, I made it a little bit easier. I bought two uh, small tape recorders. Oh, yeah. One to fly and one to me, all right? And this way, I, I could cut tapes, yep. and uh, I'd, I'd make the first part of the tape uh, would be for family, general, everybody, and every break, 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 flow only, flow only, and then I'd finish the tape off for correspondence between flow and I as personal, I personal thing. I think I've still got all up in the cupboard at home. Okay. 
I think I've got most of his letters. I just put it down when we, I'd go for a gap sort of thing of time without a letter that, that he wasn't in a position to write letters. And I knew I would get one or two or maybe three um, when they arrived. So if he was out on, out on patrol and was able to scribble a note on something or another and then get it in an envelope and then when he got back in he was able to get it posted sort of thing, you know. But you, you'll, you'll have to understand because I was now, because I was with Special Forces, we didn't have an Australian uh, postal system. Ours, all our correspondence used to, <laughs> as strange as it may seem, used to go uh, from uh, Vietnam uh, over to Hawaii, Hawaii back to Australia. So, uh, and that was pretty fast. That was, there, were, there was no messing around. Uh, but as Flo said, you know, there were, there were these breaks and that obviously the breaks are, you're out on operation. And uh, if I could get something to her, uh, would normally uh, be on my military little pad, uh, no paperwork, <laughs> I didn't carry that stuff. And of course, uh, all I'd do is uh, give it, a chopper would come in, right? Uh, and I'd have it in a little pack, you know, probably part of a, a ration pack or something, I'd put it in that, right? And I'd write the address on it, right? And when he got back to base, they, he just took it out of that, put it in an envelope and addressed it. But uh, mainly it was uh, through tapes, uh, and, and we found that a lot better. It was. Yeah. It was. It was. Yeah. The boy, the boy, the family could hear my voice, and yeah. you know, uh, and and I think that done um, uh, well in your case, if you if you were old enough at the time, you you would have, uh, would have appreciated. Okay, Dad's talking to us, sort yeah, of. Thing. Oh, yeah. 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 So. Our Ameri the American system had no failures, really. Right? The only failures was me, couldn't get stuff back. But flows has always come back. As soon as I come off operation, there was the, the, the mail was there and uh, the tape was there and what have you. Were you able to follow what was going on over there on the, the TV and the newspaper? Well, I didn't make a great big uh, deal of watching it. If it was come on the news and we were having a meal or something like that. Yeah, I'd watch it, but I, I didn't sort of go out of my way to, to watch it, sort of thing. I, sort of, yeah. That, I think. Um, that that helped me more, to deal with it, uh, than sitting there and watching it and wondering where Keith is and what's you know how he's getting on and all of this sort of thing, you know. Um, so by just sort of keeping it at arm's length, uh, I think was was the better thing to do. Yeah. We were in Maori quarters, and uh, the car would go past. We were living in a married quarter house. Yeah. But not in married quarters. No. Yeah. no, no, no. We weren't actually in married quarters, right. like as. We were in amongst the civilian population. The houses were but were at Stafford Heights in Brisbane, oh, yeah. right? And um, anyhow, um, this morning um, I was making our bed, and and um, Ron, our eldest lad, came in and he said, "Mum, there's a car pulled up outside, an army car," and I thought. Oh, so I took a deep breath and I said, how many men are there? He said, one. So... One on the driver. Oh, well, yeah, but no, it was one like that was coming up to the house sort of thing. Mm. And he was coming to, to let me know that... KP had been, no, that's right, I said to, when he said it, uh, 
one. I said, oh, thank goodness for that. He's been wounded. If it had been two, there would have been a padre. Keith uh, would have been the, the officer to advise and the padre for... So you knew straight away? Yeah, he'd been that he'd been hurt. Right. Yeah. Right. By that, so that sort of took a big a load. It, was, it wasn't very nice, it was, you know, but it was sort of a relief at the same time by knowing the fact that, had a, you know, knowing the fact that there was two if, he, if he'd passed, you know, he'd, he'd been killed. Padre. Mm, and that, that would have meant the Padre would have been there. So he made you a cup of tea, did not he? No, that was the next time. And how much that was the next time. And how much information was he about? Was he able to give you about? He was just. He just said that that uh, he'd been wounded, wasn't serious, um, and that um, he was all right and was had resu resumed duties. Right. So, and I said, thank goodness. <laughs> I had never seen a Victoria Cross. The first one I seen was my buddy A. Well, Simo and I served together over the years, all the time. You know. the, a lot of AATDV are like that, queer people. Simo's announcement was coming on, and uh, I came down from Play Q to Saigon along with a couple of the other blokes and everything. They couldn't drag us all out of the paddock and everything. Simo's uh, uh, announcement came out, and I was with that, and, he, and we had a couple of tubes after, and... You know, uh, that photo? That photo yeah, and then of course, uh, uh, about a right. mine was a month after, wasn't it? About a month after, uh, yeah, because the two actions I'd been up in the Ben Head area, right, and uh, uh, on my patrolling, I found some corduroy in over this low land and everything and tank bays and everything and I thought oh boy they're gonna move in here big time right so when my after action report went in well I, what I did was uh, I said I wanted a B-52 bomb strike strange warrant officer calling in a B-52 bomb strike no not strange at all right so uh they give me a timing for two o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, and I and, and it's it's now about three o'clock in the afternoon, and I and they said, you know, uh, when we scrub unscrabbled all the bloody uh, sequel on the bloody orders, get below the blue line, and the blue line's about four and a half k's away, and I, you know, south of me, and I'm I'm to it, uh, this is great. And I pulled off the worst tactical move I ever made in my life, mate. But by Jesus, I got away from that bloody area. I can tell you. I never got below the blue line. At, uh, I tucked the company in to, um, uh, uh, in, in, into a nice bloody ravine. Bang, in you go. Big spur line both sides of me and the hill in front of me on that bomb thing. <laughs> Two o'clock in the morning, they come in and I'm on the radio and go to the November, go to the November, don't you, don't you dare come bloody south. Because <laughs> they'd done the bomb run in. If they'd have come south and done the, the next line, right, they'd have bloody got me. So, but go to the November and I was given a bloody November. I'll be to all those bloody blokes and those aircraft knew what bloody November was. Right. So, uh, and the strike came in and then of course I got pulled out. Uh, I, I was taken out and Simo went in to do my BDA. Right? Uh, what BDA is. Eh? BDA. Bomb assessment damage. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, BDA. Thanks, Bob. Bomb assessment damage. Yeah. Right? And 
so, of course, Charles had jumped over the fence at this stage. It was, we were only about uh, K and a half, this side of the bloody fence off the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Not far for him to walk. Right? But when, when, this is the other thing. When I first found these bloody tracks and why I was late there in the afternoon, I get, had to get choppers and get this bloody tank ammunition and everything out. And of course, there now the Americans are telling me, don't say anything about tanks, don't put it in your orders, don't, don't tell anybody. And I said, oh, Jesus Christ, mate, somebody's got to know about bloody tanks. Mm. Right? Fortunately, when Simo went in, to do my VDA, he, they hadn't bought in the tanks. They'd bought in the troops, and what they were doing now was uh, starting to enclose in, in the area, right? And this was the 24th Regiment came into this one. 27th Regiment came in from the northwest, right? And then coming in from this area, right, was the 66th Regiment. My friends, my lovely friends. Uh, 66 regiment. So Simo's there and then Simo walks into it, bang, the box is on. But I'd been down in Buprang and I was outside a bloody gun range, right? Mortar range, gun range, everything. I was, yeah, so I got all this bloody ammunition out and then I had to, oh, I had to extricate from the bloody area in a big hurry. Uh, and I did. It was uh, true light in advance, mate. <laughs> Bolt through the bloody jungle, <laughs> over ridge lines, and I was going. And and I was tough too, I might add. And uh, I'd been down in Boo Prang, see, and I was outside a gun range and everything, and I was bottled up in there with one of the battalions of the 66th Regiment. Right, and uh, I'd bottled up in there for three days. I couldn't leave the bloody position because I'd, I'd, I'd been wounded the three days before. So they didn't know the, about that one. This thing, didn't right? And I, I got smacked, and I, I, I still stayed in command of the company and took them in. And then uh, uh, I said, OK, well, look, I can't leave. I've got these bloody casualties here and, and, and there's no way I'm going to leave the bloody casualties, right? So I needed ammunition and I needed water. Uh, two things we did need, badly. We needed water because I was given albumin to the bloody wounded and I'd collect the water from uh, most of the company and left them with enough to just... No bruise, no nothing, mate. Just sweet taste of water every now and again, and I'd give it, given it to the wounded. Well, Jerry was Jerry, my, who was the my medic, great bloke, and uh, he uh, uh, and he was looking after the wounded, and plus he was looking after his own platoon in the rear, and his platoon, in actual fact, was securing the LZ that we'd cut and blown down with bloody C4, we, we were making more bloody noise. Well, he knew where we were, so what, what, what the hell, you know? And he was throwing bloody everything at us. So I said, OK, do build a bloody LZ. And he must have known that I wasn't moving, right? And we were using everything that we bloody well could do. We, he was shooting rockets at us and we were getting the bloody tail fin, shoving C4 in it and plonking in a bloody debt and throwing it, <laughs> throwing it out on the end of the bloody clicker and go, oh, cop yeah. this one. <laughs> it's a bit of your own shit. <laughs> but we were out of, out of ammo, not, not completely. I, I had enough to uh, stop the stopped the last attack and then I had a bit left over. But I was shuffling it around and I was frightened of taking it away from this rear platoon because he kept coming up the same bloody ridge line. And I couldn't believe that this donkey was, was continually 
coming up that bloody ridge line, right? And because uh, I, I thought he's going to come around on, on that other spur, he's going to hit me from there. He's got to. No, nothing ever happened. No. You, you. <laughs> uh, well, if if you have any service, you know you know what it's all about, anyhow. Uh, you have a responsibility, and my, my responsibility, I was, I was uh, the company commander, and it was my responsibility to look after my soldiers, right? Uh, and basically, that's all that happened, but it happened under very arduous sort of circumstances. But uh, uh, you, you either accept the responsibility or you bloody well don't. And if you're not going, if you just want to be uh, an, an officer walking around uh, with a bloody stick on the arm and looking like Lord Lord Haw or, or somebody, well, that's not being, uh, you know, that's not what you're supposed to do. You, you have a responsibility and you have to bloody well make sure that you carry out that responsibility. Simple. And then actually... First, uh, yeah, OK, I, I was called back to uh, Saigon and under fictitious arrangement uh, and everything. Uh, my CO, RDF Lloyd, uh, had finally accepted the fact that he had to go on bloody leave, so he was back in Australia on leave uh, and visiting Canberra at the same time and all this sort of stuff. And a taking over from him for, was Frank Johnson. And uh, Frank and I got along real well. He was a, a major. Uh, and he, he was a nice bloke, and uh, he said to me, he said, oh, you've got to go up and see uh, the commander, us commander, us, for, us forces, and I said, oh, right out. Because it wasn't unusual for a training team bloke to go up and see the general, right? Because you'd come, I'd, I'd been before, uh, you know, you come out of the paddock and you got information that you want to put there but you can't put it on a bloody after-action report and one of them was that bloody tank ammunition. Anyhow, uh, so I went up and they knocked on the door and he says, come! Oh, I hate that. Ooh, I hate an officer telling me to come. Uh, right. And anyhow, I went in. I never had a headdress on, so I took the tension and he, and he said, uh, allow me to be the first to congratulate you. The Queen has awarded you the Victoria Cross and he led across the table and to shake hands and I took a pace back and said, oh shit, <laughs> <laughs> don't put that on the record. <laughs> uh, that's what happened. So, so what went through your mind? Eh? What went through your mind? Well, <laughs> I just shook hands with him and then he said, now, he said, you've got five minutes right, to accept or not. Really? Yeah. And then so. that's where I was talking about. In that five minutes is when our yeah. minds should have been telling me that he was having the runaround trying oh, to find you. Everything oh. is open. Everything, all the lines are open to Buckingham Palace. So they're waiting? Yep, all the way. Wow, I didn't know that. Right, waiting on my decision. Wow. Yeah. So uh, they just and, stand uh, by, literally. Yeah. And, uh, well, the secretary or somebody. Somebody, yeah. yeah. And then, because uh, it was the 11 o'clock announcement, right? And I was told at about half past 10, between then and 11, anyhow. It didn't take me long to walk down to uh, where the media were and everything. And, and, I, and, he, and I said, he said, well, do you accept? And I said, on behalf of my blokes, yes. Which I did. They done a great job. They, was it a hard you know, decision? Yeah. So, uh, and uh, so then we walked down and They'd done the media announcement and everything else like that. And of course, at this time, everything's rolling uh, pretty fast, you know. 
and uh, they'd made the announcement and everything, and everybody was breaking up, and Chuta came over, Simo. What do you call him? <laughs> Chuta. 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 Chuta <laughs> Japanese for wait a minute. <laughs> Chuta came over. Ray, Ray came over and he said, let's go and have a beer, mate. Right? Uh, so we walked out of the bloody room, into the next bloody office, and he went, here, mate. <laughs> and he, is that that photo? Yeah. Uh, be pretty close to it. Yeah. yeah. That photo was the same. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Simone and I have a beer. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah, mate. He had, he had it all teed up. The booze was right next door, mate. Yeah, so he's, <laughs> he's not all yeah. been through it. Yeah. yeah. Three yeah. weeks. Did it help to have Ray there? Oh, yeah, mate, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, not only because he'd, he'd already received you know, the Victoria Cross, that was great in itself, you know, because... He hadn't received it, but he'd been... He'd been yeah, well, he hadn't been invested, but he'd been yeah. told, right? So, but we'd served together, and, and he always said, you know, if anybody's going to get a bloody VC, it'll be bloody stupid old Jutta, right? Because he was a great soldier, yeah. great bloody soldier, yeah. he and uh, a DCM. yeah, yeah, he, he got a DCM, the uh, uh, distinguished conduct medal. Yeah, how many tours did Ray do in the end? Four or five? Uh, no, he done one, two, three, three, three tours. Three tours. And his oh. first tour, uh, he got his DCM, but he was wounded, and he they patched his leg up, but it was half an inch shorter than his left leg. <laughs> <laughs> so they weren't going to re-enlist him, right? Now he went back to Japan because he had a Japanese bride, and he uh, was barman in the embassy, Australian embassy. <laughs> oh, first up, first up, it was Dixie Bashing in a cadet camp at, at Holdsworthy. <laughs> Dixie Bashing, what's that? Yeah, it was working. He's <laughs> Dixie Bash and they was trying to get back in the army and they wouldn't bloody well have him. So, so here's the Dixie Bash now, because he was a warrant officer. No? <laughs> so, so he's up in the sergeant's mess and everybody else is down there and, they, and, he, and he, the old Dixie Bash is doing all right. So he went back to Japan, got a job at the embassy, saved up some money. Got himself on a bloody US aircraft out of oh, it's cunning bastards. <laughs> Conned himself a ride on a bloody uh, aircraft without the flight. Bloody career, uh, Vietnam, he came. And uh, he, he took and started. He went to a village, and, uh, and they never had any village protection. so. He went, went about the whole business and he recruited the, some, some of the bloody blokes and everything and conned weapons off the Yanks and everything, barbed wire of the place up and everything, oh. waiting to get back in the army. And, of course, the army is saying, yes, Ray, we'll then first up they weren't going to re-enlist him because, you know, we, he's home only. He'd been wounded. he got a short leg and all this stuff. He's done a lot of work by that stuff. Yeah, so, and already been, already been awarded the yeah, DCM. DCM. Right? So, uh, and, and of course, to get any money, the training team were paying him. Right? And, and of course, the Yanks, the Yanks from Special Forces and everybody that knew him were throwing in a dollar or two here and there. So he was doing all right. Yeah. You know? And uh, finally, they said, uh, Right, oh, Ray, we'll, we will enlist you, but you've got to come home. And he said, I'm not coming home. He said, you, you enlist me, and I want to go back to Special Forces. <laughs> Dogmatic bastard. Anyhow, <laughs> they enlisted him, and he came back to Special Forces. <laughs> and he, he took over to his old company again. <laughs> and just picked up where he left off. Yeah, yeah. right where he left off, right. And uh, after the after the action that got him the Victoria Cross, 
they took him away from the company and, and, and they couldn't get him out of special forces. Right? So they give him a job. And his job was to assess the company in the field. Right? So he had three, three Benjis out of his own mob, right? Uh, and away they went. You, you had to have a bloody company patrolling and everything along the bloody border and Simo and his little bunch would be following along behind him or up alongside him and he'd come back and say, too much noise and so and so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is what he was doing. I said, Jesus Christ, mate. It didn't come near me, Sam. <laughs> Bad co I'd only just fleetingly met, you know. Uh, and that was back in Australia, and he was an artillery officer then. He hadn't changed corps, and you don't talk to artillery like you don't talk to RQMS, as you see. <laughs> he was a major too, wasn't he? So. <laughs> hmm. yeah, he said he was a major too, wasn't he? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, now, apparently, uh, uh, Peter, though, uh, was, uh, he was a mad infant here. Uh, wanted to be, they called him the galloping major anyhow. Uh, apparently he used to stick his head out uh, quite a lot uh, and look after his blokes uh, from what we hear coming back and everything. So uh, once again he, uh, as an Australian, he made sure that, uh, well he didn't do it purposely, we didn't, all don't do it purposely. People knew that he was an Australian. There's, there's, there's a difference. He's not an American. He's one of those crazy bloody Australians, you see. Uh, and, and people knew him for that. And uh, quite often you'd bump into an American that would uh, serve doing a couple of sewers, and, you know. He said, God damn that major. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, they loved Peter. Yeah. You know, yeah, they loved him. He is a good bloke. All right, Dasher. I could tell you some bloody fast. <laughs> yeah, no, Dasher, Dasher, I first met uh, Dasher on the football field. And uh, he, was, he was a rough part, rough bloody play to play football against. And you knew when you stepped over that line uh, to play a game of football, you were going to play a game of football. There was no sweat about it. Once you step back over the line, there you go, mate, have a beer. Because <laughs> he liked his beer, Dasher. Uh, but he was uh, a very forward sort of a bloke. Bit of a... Had a bit of a bushy in him sort of thing, yeah, you know. Uh, he... He was outstanding in his own way because of his character. Right, uh, and, and obviously a brave man, you know, he, uh, Donnie Palmer, who was uh, with him at the time, of, what's his name, uh, and Don's passed on, uh, he, uh, he, he said Dasher was bloody crazy, mate, it's the things he used to do, you know, but when I, when I say crazy because of the things he used to do, he did them tactically sound. Right, everything, everything the boats did, it was tactically sound. It wasn't just being stupid, right? Uh, and of course, being an outstanding Australian, he he knew Swanee well, uh, and he wasn't going to leave him. Now, he was his mate. Yeah, uh, and and uh, Vic was Vic was dead. Yeah, and he was still carrying it, right? So, uh, yeah, uh, and, and, and it was sad, sad to, to lose uh, a character like Dasher. He, he, he could have gone a long way uh, as a business manager. He'd be bloody hard, but he'd be a good manager, you know. Uh, he, he'd have to soften his tone a little bit. <laughs> 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 uh, 
No, he, yeah, well, he, he was he, he was Dasher. He was he was a character, you I, know. I don't think there's anybody else who yeah. would have did what he did. Yeah. From the outside, it doesn't make sense. It's heartbreaking what he did. Yeah, but he didn't know. Oh, I'm sure he didn't know that Swano was gone. No. You know. As far as he was concerned, he, 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 was, he was helping his mate, right? Uh, uh, and and, and I, I can see that, right? Once again, uh, Swan A would become his responsibility sort of thing, yeah. right? Uh, do your job. And uh, he wasn't going to leave him in a paddock. We, well, nobody does. You know, we don't do that. Uh, I, I had to leave uh, Montez uh, after he passed away. At uh, the circumstances, uh, and, and I put back in a radio call, uh, and I, I was uh, operating through a spooky that I had up the top. And he came on station, and uh, I told him not to use his ordnance, and uh, you know, but to, to fly around me to cover the noise that I, because I had bloody wounded and everything, and I'd been hit myself, and I wasn't feeling too bloody ha uh, healthy, but I wasn't going to leave him, and uh, and uh, uh, one of the Otten Yard had passed away. And I wanted the other modern yards to carry his body, and they said, no, no, it's, it's not done. But, so Was there I, just, they I said to Jerry, I said, Jerry and Oriama, I said, well, what's the go? We, we, we can't carry the body. And I said, now, Jerry, and they were both medics anyhow. And they both carried out, uh, you know, the necessary to say that he, he was dead. He wasn't, you know. And uh, so when, and, and of course Montez, we were c trying to carry him and uh, it was bloody hell of a night. And he, uh, and uh, he, uh, uh, and I was talking through Spooky from back to Duck Toe uh, to get a helicopter in with a Maguire rig to lift him out of the bloody scrub because nowhere in the world a bloody chopper was going to land and there was nowhere in the world that... Uh, uh, I had the Spooky up, which, which would have frightened the gentleman down the bottom that was firing at us anyhow. But he... Uh, so he... At Ducktail, Ducktail had the uh, Jagels, Major Jagels, Special Forces, who was looking after us blokes. He had his CNC bird there, but he had, didn't have a Maguire rig. But after this incident, he got a bloody Maguire rig, all right. right? Uh, and, uh, he, so, and he was going to come in, and I said, well, it's no good you're coming in without a Maguire rig. You can't bloody well land, right? So the chopper that with the Maguire rig was back at bloody Play Q, uh, and it had to fly up, and the young black, and we know the name of him now, since, the, since then there's been a lot of investigation ended, right? Uh, the Special Forces blokes wanted to know who wouldn't, didn't want to fly that night, and then, and then I got this pilot, and then one of them said, you're flying, mister. <laughs> yeah, this is it, boy, you're flying. Right. And uh, so, but he got about halfway up when Montez passed out. And while, while he, all this was happening, I moved forward on my own and done a bit of scouting around to find a, a bit of a hole in the canopy so that he could get lifted out. And I, when I came back, Jerry said to me, he said, Montez is not going to make it. And I said, well, what's his chances of making it on a Maguire? He said, about the same as what it is on the ground. And I said, well, at least we'll get his bloody body out. Right? Uh, 
but he passed away. Montez passed away, and I uh, aborted the chopper. Uh, and uh, I asked for permission now to leave the body. We couldn't carry him. The modern yards weren't carrying him. We had bloody wounded, and, and we weren't in a, a state to take the body out. Now, the, the whole thing was, uh, and, and, and back at our <laughs> firm base, <laughs> if you'd like to call it a firm base, uh, they, were, they were rigging up and everything to get out the next morning to pick up the body, right? But now, uh, well, we got in at about 2 o'clock in the morning. We got into the firm base business and all. So, and I, I said to Tolly, I walked, I went around, I put all my binges down and, and everything, and uh, I made sure that uh, the people that were in the pit with them stayed awake and let them have a sleep and all the rest of it, right? And get, had the wounded looked after, and then Jerry and I crashed down. Uh, and, and I'd been back where that hole was in the ground. Yeah, that night. So I said to Jerry, yeah, Jerry, both of us. Last time I went back to Vietnam, we went back with uh, the uh, uh, people out of, uh, out of Hawaii who was passing us to look for the remains and everything, our bodies on the eastern seaboard, right? So uh, they... Uh, I met up with Jerry in uh, Da Nang, uh, and that crew was there, and then we went back up into the position itself. And it's strange, uh, the position now has got a road, uh, and, and the cutting is there, and as you come out of the cutting, walk up out of the cutting, right there was the bloody pit <laughs> where oh. Jerry and I slept in that night. Really? Right there. And I said, Jerry, have a look at this. And he said, God damn. He said, Keith, you come over here. <laughs> and I walked over about 20 yards and he said, This is where I was standing when that lump of mortar hit me. <laughs> he, got, <laughs> he got wounded. <laughs> right there. Yeah. And I said, Well, man, there you go, <laughs> you see. Because I always told him, Night time, you go down, boy. Don't bloody start walking around. But everybody else was walking around. Uh, the gentleman threw in a few mortars and he wore a bit of it. Yeah. So uh, that took him out of the paddock. But he, went, he did go back in because I went, uh, he went back as far as Tokyo to the hospital in Tokyo and they wanted to send him back stateside, you know, you're finished. And he said, no, he said, I'm going back to Nam. <laughs> yeah. So where did he end up? up at bloody Ben Head, Special Forces camp. And I said, Jesus Christ, would you just save that bloody camp? He'll take it again. You know, you're not stupid. And so I, I, I went over to, what was his bloody name? Colonel. Colonel Kearns. He named my operation after himself, this bloody donkey. Yeah. Uh, what was his name? Oh, anyhow. So I went over and seen him in his office and what the fuck, I didn't think this is. Why didn't you send Dolro back up to bloody Bayonet? I didn't send him there, he wanted to go there. And I thought, oh. So I jumped on the chopper and I went and I gave Jerry a few words. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, I've seen him a couple of times now in yeah. the States and everything, you know. Do you have any much contact with the other uh, American veterans at all? Yeah, well, I spoke to Donnie Taylor when, about a fortnight ago. Was that a couple of weeks ago? Yeah. 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 Okay. So you've obviously made some good friends. Oh, well. yeah. Well, they, they've got a Special Forces reunion on, but, but Flo and I went uh, to yeah. a reunion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the first time I went over, because Don... Donnie Taylor worked, uh, lived just outside of uh, Fort Bragg. Uh, Don and I visited Fort Bragg and I 
of course, I had to do all the generals. And we, strangely, you talked about the training team. At the uh, memorial in Fort Bragg, with the training team's got its uh, own plaque and everything uh, at the memorial. That's good. Yeah. That's good, yeah. Well, um, and, um, and my photo and everything's in the, in the Hall of Fame. So, Flo, um, when did you first hear that Keith was going to receive the VC? Um, did you know what the VC <laughs> was? Well, I did by then because of Raymond Ray's get, getting his, and um, uh, I was at work. I was working at uh, Cyclone KM up in uh, Gbung there. The boys were at school. It was lunch time, and I'd gone to go to lunch. And uh, I was, normally I would have been working the switchboard and, um, uh, and reception. And for me to go to lunch, another lass came in. And by the time I got from there and out down and to the, um, uh, to the rec room, um, I was being paged and all the phones, uh, there were two phones I think there was in the rec room were both engaged. So I had to go back up into the main office again. And I made a comment to the expert. Well, she said, you've got two calls waiting now. I said, oh, gee, I'm popular today, aren't I? Famous last words. Anyhow, so I took the first call and it was my sister who had working at a hairdressing salon and you should have heard the commotion there because I used to go there as well to get my hair done and I and I knew a lot of her, a lot of her customers were regulars and they all knew me sort of thing you know and the place was in a real commotion and I said Mark what is going on and she's trying to tell me and I, I thought, what, what's 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 all the noise? What's it going on? She said, Keith's been awarded the Victoria Cross. How did they find out? Well, it had been announced. On TV? Well, what had happened, no, the radio, I think it was at the, t yeah, yeah, the radio anyway. Yeah. Anyhow, what had happened was Major Alan Hines had been to home to find me, it couldn't find me. The front door and everything was open, the house was, anybody could have walked in and out. And so he obviously thought, well, she's up the shops, which was just up the street sort of thing. And uh, anyhow, uh, first of all, with these phone calls, I suddenly then, Margaret was saying to me, isn't it marvellous, isn't it wonderful, wonderful? And then suddenly the penny dropped. I've got another phone call. So I got on to that and it was Maxie, Max Stack's wife, whose husband was in Vietnam as well. Oh, he was AAPC, wasn't he? Um, I'm not sure whether... He, I, was Maxie Stack a, a training team? Maxie Stack? Yeah. No. No, he, he, he was with either a unit or something, you know. Anyhow, she's, and she's congratulating and, and everything, you know, saying how wonderful and all the rest about it, you know, so that was that. Anyhow, so I took, had a quick talk with her and then went back to my sister and there's, and the commotion was still going on there, you know. Oh, and the mums, blah, 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 carrying on. Anyhow, um, so I eventually signed off on that and went and had my lunch. Just came back into my office to take over. And um, um, in walked Major Alan Hines. And um, 
he had met the lady next door who unfortunately has just passed away. And he, ha she told, he told, uh, she told him where I was, where at work and everywhere it was and everything. So Alan turned up and uh, fortunately for me, my boss was a submariner or ex-submariner. And so I told him and said, look, you know, because of the commotion and everything, uh, you know, I don't think I would get much work done sort of thing. And could I have the afternoon off by all means, you know, so away I went. And uh, I was driving my car, Alan was following me. And I got d turned off Appleby Road and down Java Street and if you didn't turn right or left, you went straight into our front yard. And uh, at this time, now, Alan, yeah, now if Alan hadn't been following me, there's no way in the wide world that I would have gone into that, I would have turned and just gone <laughs> The people that were there was media. just, media, yeah. everything, it was just unbelievable. And how, um, so I pulled in, went under the hat, like pulled up underneath the house where I parked the car, Alan was right behind me. And of course everybody started to converge on me when I came out and Alan said, Stop. Mrs. Payne's going upstairs. She's going to have a cup of tea. And then you can talk to her after that. Yeah. So he, he took right over. Well, got up into, up into the house. Flo, where is your jug, your tea? And he made me a cup of tea. I sat down and we had that and had a little chat sort of thing. It's it's been a lot to process. It was. Well, I, I, my mind went back to when um, Edna's husband, Dasha Wheatley, and remembering her on the TV and that sort of thing when he, after when because he, he was the first one, and how um, so I collected myself and. Uh, Alan said, "Right, are you ready to to meet the meet the press?" <laughs> I said, "All right, I've got to." So we did. We went through all of that sort of thing, you know. And uh, as as they were starting to disperse, the kids were starting to come home from school, and two lads were walking down. No, they wouldn't have known. No, they didn't have a clue, and of course, when. Uh, Ronald and Gregory got close to me. No, Gregory wasn't with me. He was still over at uh, Auntie Margaret's, I think. Ronald and a mate. And he, and he got, got to a, the house and he said, Mum, what's going on? What's all of this? Who are all these people? And he had, then I sort of had to try and explain to him. And he said, oh, golly, you know. Yes, 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 yeah. Fourteen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we'd been through it with um, with uh, rays, you see. That must but have that it, it, well, in in lots of ways, yes, it did. Yeah. Because I, I wrote and I wrote to Keith. I was writing to Keith uh, a couple of nights after um, Ray's announcement, and there'd all been a leak that there had been another Victoria Cross awarded. Uh -huh. And I, I'm writing to, to Keith sort of thing that uh, there's a, a piece in the paper that uh, another VC was, has been awarded. He's supposed to be living in New, from New South Wales and has four sons and a daughter. So. So, if you know who he is, please congratulate him. <laughs> hey, Keith, um, the AAT TV, uh, what, what does that mean to you now? As a unit, uh, 
uh, I knew a lot of the blokes for a start, right? But the the uh, deployment and what the tasking was of AATDV was, in most cases, well above the what was normally expected of a fellow of that rank, right? If he was a, a, a major, he had a, he was a sector senior advisor. Bang, he's got the whole, whole damn sector, right? Uh, and they were old, no, normally old majors, right? Not from the ranks, but those at that time, the promotion was slow and you know, everything like that. And, uh, and in the mind, they were pretty good fellows and, and they were pretty smart. You know, for for majors, uh, you know, majors aren't the smart, smartest people in the world sometimes, and uh, so, and and of course the warrant officers, uh, they're they're deploying with the Arvin, they're deploying with the company, the battalion, they're advising the battalion commander, and you know. Uh, 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 and in, in special forces case, uh, your company commander. Poof, away you go, Charlie. Mm. Right. So, what IATTV means to me now is uh, it is uh, 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 was an organisation of people who were, in actual fact, highly trained. We were all highly trained, as I was mentioned before this. Uh, learning curve, learning curve, learning curve, um, and we were pretty, uh, pretty old warrant officers at the time. You know, uh, I, I was 35 as a warrant officer, and uh, uh, and most of the some of the blokes were World War One, uh, World War Two, uh, in the early part of the team, and everything else like that. So a, a reputation was brought about by the unit, by the individuals of the unit uh, as the decorations for the unit uh, show. And pleasing to note that uh, uh, we have now carried on and we've had a, a training team, Iraq and what team. So uh, the colours go on.